Now, if we haven't got a chance to meet yet, my name is Nate, and uh, I'm so glad you're here on this beautiful Easter Sunday. Uh, welcome to Oasis Church. If this is your very first time or you've been part of our family for just a little bit, I want to say welcome home. And uh, you are at our very first ever Easter service as a church. So come on. We're excited about that. Our first Easter, I remember last Easter, right? Like a month before Easter is when the shutdown happened. And I remember we had just ordered a bunch, like a bunch of like Easter door hangers and all this like promotional material. It was going to be our first Easter at the high school. And we were getting ready to hand out like thousands of door hangers in neighborhoods and invite people to Easter. And then, you know, the shutdown happened and we were just looking at all of our Easter stuff like this is now useless. But it's, we still got some of it in our garage just to remember our first Easter. But uh, this is our first one in person, and so uh, grateful to gather together as a church family today. And All year we've been walking through the book of Philippians, talking about joy, and I want to continue that march through the book of Philippians today and talk about joy, but also I want to tie it in with the resurrection and the Easter story, because I think there's, I, I, the resurrection ties in with every verse of Scripture. It's what the entirety of Scripture points towards. It's it's the it's the it, it's what the Old Testament is 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 prophesying about. It's what the Gospels and Jesus is doing, and it's what the rest of the New Testament is declaring: the fact that Jesus is alive. And so, today I want to read in Philippians chapter number three, starting in verse number seventeen. And I've got a lot of reading to do this morning. Is that okay? Are you guys good to go? Um, if you're brand new here, you want to know what Oasis Church is about, we like the Bible here. We believe the Bible, and uh, I don't believe it's my words that's going to change your heart or change your life, but I believe that God's Word can do that. And so we look at the Bible every week. Philippians chapter number 3, verse number 17. If you're ready, somebody say, yeah. yeah. Join together in following my example, brothers, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do, for as I have often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. Don't you love that verse? Our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a savior from there the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Now I want to read two more passages from the Gospel of Luke. We'll have it on the screen behind me. Luke chapter 19. This is, this is a Palm Sunday passage. This is when Jesus is coming into the holy city to be crucified. Luke chapter 19 Verse number 28, after Jesus had said this, he went on ahead up to Jerusalem as he approached Bethphage in Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives. He sent two of his disciples and he said to them, go to the village ahead of you. As you enter it, you'll find a colt. You're going to see a donkey. He's going to be tied up there, which no one has ever written. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. The Lord needs it. Now, Skip ahead five chapters to Luke chapter 24. This is the last one we're going to read today. Luke chapter 24. This is right after Jesus has risen in verse number one. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And while they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning, they stood beside them. And in their fright, the women bowed with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? Don't you love that question? Why do you look for the living amongst the dead? I think this is a, revel a, a prevalent question today. Why, why do we look for life in things that have no life? Why, why do we look for life in things that are not Christ? If we want to find life, we need to look to Him. Why are you looking into the world for all these things for life when there's no life? That's not my sermon today, but there you go. He's not here. Verse number six, He is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified and on the third day, be raised again. And then they remembered his words. Today I want to look at these three different passages and tie them together and talk from this idea, joy in a different way. Joy in a different way. 
Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you that it's not just a notebook and ink on paper. It's not just fables and old stories, but God, this is, this is your word. This is what we believe to be true today. And I pray that you would do what I cannot, and that is change our hearts and change our lives. Lord, I pray when we leave this place, we wouldn't have just heard a talk and sang a song, but would we have met with you. So speak to us today, Lord, in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. 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 You can take your seat. I've said it a lot uh, throughout our first year and a half as a church, and I believe it to be true that when God wants to do something new in your life, something fresh in your life, when God wants to take you into a new season, when God wants to change a direction maybe that he has for you, when God wants to uh, develop the content of your character in a new way, when he wants to teach you something new, when God wants to do something new and fresh in your life um, in, in a season, I believe that God will send a person in your life to help do that. And I've said this before, when when, when God sends new people into your life or new voices into your life or new people into your circle, look out because God wants to do something new. God, every time in my life that I look back and God has done something new or taught me something new, it's been because there's been a new person, a new voice, a, a new person God has brought into my life in order for God to help accomplish, or in order to help God accomplish what he wants to accomplish in my life. God, God works through people and, and he'll do that in our life. And we've talked about that a lot here at Oasis, but... I found in my own life, um, sometimes those people that are on assignment in my life to do something in my life aren't always people that I maybe joyfully want in my life or, or the things that they're saying or what they're telling me, I don't realize at the time what they're doing. All right, so for example... I remember when I was called to ministry. I was 16 years old. I preached my first sermon. I felt a call to ministry, and I sat down with some of my pastors. You know, help me. What do I do, right? Like, you know, here's, here's what I feel like God's, you know, help me, help me fine-tune my calling. Help me develop. Help me train, all this kind of stuff. And, and you know, so I, I'm thinking, right, like, okay, uh, sermon development, right? Like, you know, so preaching 101, blah, blah, blah. No, they're like, all right, all right, Nate, here we go, here we go. We're going we're gonna to sit down, come to my office, we're going to talk. Um, uh, you need to show up at 6 a.m. and stack chairs every Wednesday morning. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> um, yeah, you, you need to uh, be at church um, an hour before on Sundays down in the basement. We're going to pray with the elders of the church. We're just going to call heaven and I are just going to pray, right? Like, okay, you need to like lead the youth games and go to Walmart and buy a bunch of crazy stuff for youth stuff and just, you know, like all, all these different things where I'm like, oh. in my mind, I'm thinking like, okay, okay, that's fine. But like, I told you I was called the ministry. Not called to stair check, or chair stacking. Not called to like uh, youth camp fun, right? But what I didn't know that they knew, because God put them in my life to develop something in me, and they thought higher and lived higher and were thinking on a different level than I was able to think at the time. What they knew was, was what you need in ministry is, is, is not, not a desire for a platform, but character that's developed in a prayer life that will sustain you. What you need in ministry is not to just want to be seen in front of people, but to be at the church at 6 a.m. when nobody sees you, stacking chairs, doing the dirty work, because it's not about that. It's about serving the kingdom when nobody's looking. So they were, they were thinking higher than I was thinking. They, they were thinking on another level. I, I, I thought I knew what I wanted, but they really knew what I needed. I mean, I think about this even in college. I had a class, Bible school, called, it, it was evangelism. It was a class on evangelism, how to share your faith. It's pretty cool, right? A whole college class about how to share your faith and sharing your faith with people around you and all this kind of stuff. And so, again, I'm thinking, like, all right, man, give me the, like, hook, line, sinker, right? Like, you're at the coffee shop and just, like, boom, 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 evangelism 101, all this, you know, all this kind of stuff. Like, give me the good lines. Give me the right, you know, right tactics to share your faith and all, all this kind of stuff. And I remember Dr. Wheeler was my professor. I remember it was a class with hundreds of people, so this exercise cost him a lot of money. He gave everyone in the class a dollar. 
He's like, hey, here's your, here was the big, here was the whole class, the whole like final report. Some of y'all are like, dang, Bible school sounds easy. I want to do this. No, the whole report was take your dollar this week and spend it on something that's not you and use it to share your faith and do a whole report on how it went and all this kind of stuff. So he's like, I don't care. You can go to the laundromat and pay for like two loads of laundry. You can go to McDonald's and get a McChicken and you just got to tip in for the tax. You know what I mean? Just a little bit. Like you can, you can do whatever. You can go to cookout. There was a cookout across the street. And how many know a cookout? You can get like nine cheeseburgers for a dollar, right? So it's like, it like you can go to cookout and just bless the whole line and, and use it as an entry to share your faith and this kind of stuff. And I just remember hearing that and I'm thinking like, I'm paying for this college class and your whole assignment everything you're giving me is here's a dollar here's a dollar go share your faith I'm like I'm paying for this like but what I didn't know that Dr. Wheeler knew is he's talking to a bunch of pastors how are you ever going to be able to share your faith if you can't share it at the laundry mat how are you ever going to be able to boldly proclaim the gospel on a stage if you can't share it in line at cookout how are you ever going to serve people collectively as a church if you can't serve people at McDonald's so he was thinking higher than I was thinking he 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 was doing something different that I didn't think I wanted but I needed the common theme in all these examples and we could go on and on about examples here I mean I even think about our own life in the last four months since we've we've got our son me and Anna adopted our first son four months ago we've got an eight-year-old that's in our home now and totally changed our world overnight and we love it so much it's so fun but but even even in things with him like you know he talks about like wanting to be strong and wanting to be fit and you know he sees like videos or whatever different kind of stuff of like people bench pressing and weights and he wants to go do that he wants to be strong and what we have to tell him as an eight-year-old is like, dude, no bench press, yes, broccoli. (laughs) Right? Like, we'll get there. Like, what you want is to be strong, but what you need is not the bench press right now. What you need is broccoli and milk and whatever, right? The common theme through all this stuff is these, these people were not giving me what I asked for. They weren't giving me what I wanted. They were giving me what I needed. Or as the theologian St. Augustine said, God will answer the prayers of your heart, not the prayers of your lips. (laughs) So it is with our God that most of the time how God's working, he's not giving you what you want. He's giving you what you need. He's answering the prayers of your heart, not the prayers of your lips. And I'm grateful in hindsight. I praise God those people didn't give me what I wanted. I praise God they gave me what I needed. This was Jesus. This was Jesus to a T. Jesus came and he was nothing that anyone asked for or wanted. Everything that they thought of him, everything they expected him to be, everything they wanted him to be, he was not at all. And you see this, we could be here all day talking about examples. We see a few of these in John chapter 4. He's at the well with the woman from Samaria. And, and he's dialoguing with her. And he's telling her that, that he's the Messiah. He's like, I am, I, he's like, I'm living water. If you drink of me, you'll never thirst again. You, your soul has not been satisfied by anything. And you've gone to relationship, to relationship, to relationship, trying to fill a void. Only I can fill it. If you drink from my well, if you drink from living water, you'll never thirst again. And, and so he's, he's telling her what she needs and at the end of the conversation she looks at him and uh, she's like yeah the perfect one the messiah is coming and he'll tell us everything and Jesus is like that's me (laughs) the one you've been having the conversation with like I'm the one like I'm just trying to tell you but like she she wasn't looking for or wanting or expecting him so she just she she missed it until Jesus flat out told her I'm he Jesus was thinking higher. Jesus was on a whole other level. Even right after he talks with that woman, he's with his disciples, and his disciples went to go get food, and they bring Jesus back food, and and Jesus is like, no, no, I'm I'm already good. His disciples are like, hey, did did he already eat? Like, he sent us into town to get food. Why why did he already eat if we just went to get him food? And Jesus says, my food is to do the will of he who sent me. They're like, so did you get that at Chick-fil-A? Like, what? (laughs) Like, Jesus like, my food is to do the will of the Father. 
In other words, like, hey, what, what sustains me, what I live for, what, what, what I need is not temporary things that we go after to satisfy a need. No, 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 it's greater, it's eternal, it's, it's my relationship with the Father. He, he's just thinking on a whole different level. He's living on a whole nother level. John chapter 13 the disciples are arguing over who's going to have the seat of power next to Jesus when Jesus comes and takes over the kingdom. Because they don't know that Jesus is coming for a spiritual kingdom. They think Jesus is coming to deliver God's people from oppression from the Romans. And it's been a bunch of people. It's been the Persians and the Babylonians and the Assyrians and all this stuff. They've been oppressed and enslaved to all these people. So they're looking for someone to come and set them free. And, and they think Jesus is going to be the military leader, the political leader that's going to set them free. And so they're arguing who's going to sit next to him? Who's going to, who's going to fill the cabinet? Who's going to have the seats of authority, the seats of power? And they're arguing about this. And as they're arguing in John chapter 13, Jesus gets the towel and begins to wash their feet. He says, hey, if you don't let me do this, if you don't let me serve you, you can have no part of me. He's he's saying, hey, the greatest among you is not the one that sits in the seat with the most authority. It's the one who serves the most. It's the one who lowers himself to make himself the least. That's the greatest. They're like, okay, that's fine, Jesus, but like, who's going to sit at your right hand? Who's going to have all over the place? Even Luke chapter 19 in this passage that we read today, when Jesus comes into Jerusalem to start Holy Week on Palm Sunday. Jesus is coming in on a colt, on a donkey. And this is very significant. Every detail of scripture is significant. There's nothing there by accident. There's nothing there that's just happenstance. Everything is telling us something about who God is. Why does Jesus come in on a donkey? All right, culturally, here's how people of power came in. With horses and chariots. (laughs) Horses and chariots just said power, and it also said speed. I can get where I need to go quicker. I've got my ensemble, I've got my chariots, my horses, I can get where I need to go. Jesus was on a donkey. Humility, lack of speed. Don't you love that the Son of God was not in a hurry? I'm not going the pace of a chariot, I'm going the pace of a donkey. I'm so confident in who I am and the authority God has given me. I don't need a chariot to flex on the people around me. I'm so confident in the power God has given me. I can stroll in on a donkey because I've got all the power in the world and don't need to. Meekness. What was Jesus doing? He certainly wasn't giving them what they wanted. He certainly was not giving them what they asked for. He was giving them what they needed. Jesus appears before Pilate, and he's claimed to be God. He's claimed to be the Son of God. And Pilate asks him about these accusations, and Jesus is silent. I'm sure all the disciples are like, Jesus, now's the time. <laughs> now, speak up, you know, you got the mic, the light's on you. Speak up. Jesus was silent. I love how Calvin said it. He said it like this, Jesus remained silent before Pilate so that ever after he might speak for us. What was he doing before Pilate? He wasn't giving us what we wanted. He was giving us what we needed. And the cross, the empty tomb, this is, this is an example of something that they definitely didn't want on that Friday. But Jesus knew, God knew. That's what they need. God is in the business of not giving people what they want, but what they need. And that is a really good thing. Some of you hear that, you're like, oh, no, that's fine. No, that's a good thing. This is a good thing. And, and Easter weekend is the greatest reminder of this. That's not what they were asking for, but that is what they needed. In fact, our entire faith hinges upon this truth that Jesus did rise again. 1 Corinthians 15 says it like this, and if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. So if Jesus had not had done this, had not given us what we needed through the cross and the empty tomb, everything, uh, you, you, don't, you can throw out the, rest, the entirety of Scripture, you can throw out the whole thing hinges upon the fact that he's alive. He has risen again. And, and here's, here's what this 
tells us. Because again, it's Jesus giving us what we needed, not what we wanted, right? It's Jesus giving us what we needed, not what we wanted. Here's, here's what Easter weekend reminds us of. Here's what it tells all of us. And it, it's this. Jesus did not come to assist you. He came to save you. The cross and the empty tomb tell us Jesus did not come to offer assistance. <laughs> Jesus came to offer salvation. Jesus didn't come to improve you. Jesus came to make you new. You were not spiritually struggling without Jesus. You were spiritually dead without Jesus. You were not spiritually having a hard time without him. You were spiritually done without him. The cross is Jesus giving us what we needed. You know, I've even heard people sometimes in church will say something like this. You know, like, just give your life over to God. You're in the driver's seat. Get out of the driver's seat. Hop in the passenger seat. Let God be in the driver's seat of your life. I think intentions are good there, but I think that still undersells the gospel. <laughs> you're not in the passenger seat co-piloting Jesus the vehicle Jesus is driving is an ambulance and you're in the back of it this is the good news of the gospel Jesus is not assisting you and, and chatting with you co-piloting no 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 he is saving you because you were dead in your sin. He is rescuing you. He is saving you. He is not improving and assisting or helping you. Giving you what you need, not what you want. He's giving us what we need. He came to save us. And this is the greatest message in all of the world. This is the greatest message in human history. Because here's what this message tells us. You don't have to save yourself. It's such a freeing and liberating message because it removes the burden of salvation off of you. Because by the way, we can't do it. It's Jesus giving us what we need. And that was rescue. That was salvation. That was, that was we were once dead, but now we're alive in Christ. And I want to real quickly tie this back to Philippians chapter 3 today because Again, the entirety of Scripture, you can point back to the resurrection. You can point back to the gospel of Jesus. But in Philippians chapter 3 today, the Apostle Paul is giving us what it looks like to be without Christ and what it looks like to have faith in Christ. He's giving us um, a, a contradiction, if you will, of people that do not have Christ and people that do. Verse number 18, I want to look at verse number 18 again of Philippians 3. It says, told you before and tell you again there's people that live as enemies of the cross of Christ which by the way that was all me and you at one point this was all of us this is not you know oh that bad person you think of no this is me and you man this is this is humanity and here's how he describes enemies of the cross you ready their destiny is destruction left to themselves they're on their way to destruction left to their own their sin is destroying them. I don't know about you. I don't need anybody to tell me, left to myself, my sin is destroying me. Left to myself, I'm, I'm, I'm headed down a path where I need saving. Anybody else with me this morning? I, I don't need to convince myself of this. And then he goes on to say, their God is their stomach. He's not just talking about food or eating here. He's talking about you're living your life. Your God is your impulses and your feelings. It's whatever you want, whatever you need, whatever needs you need satisfied, whatever thing you want now, you just do it. You just live by your greatest impulse. You just live by the greatest thing pulling at you depending on what day or season or person you're around. You, you, your impulses, your feelings, your emotions are your God. And then he says their glory is in their shame. Like the very thing you're glorying in is going to end up being the thing you're ashamed of. Like the people that crucified Jesus, the people, like the thing they were glorying in, the fact they were crucifying him, beating him and mocking him and hanging him, they were glorying in that once he died and rose again. It's the thing they're ashamed of. Thing you parade around about, again, that's, he would, he, he, he describes all these things. He puts them together in this last sentence and says, ready, here's how you could summarize these people. Ready, your mind's on earthly things. 
What are you living for right here, right now? What's your life about right here, right now? Well, I got a 20-year plan. I've got this retirement thing. Like, that's good. But, like, at the end of that, it's, it's done. Hopefully I can get there. Your, your mind is on earthly things. And if Jesus hadn't come and died and rose again, guess what? All we would have is earthly things. So live it up, baby. Live it up. Maximize it. Go for it. Let's go, right? Like, make the most of it. Live by your impulses. Live by your feelings. Squeeze every ounce you can get out of it because that's all we got if Jesus has not risen. But if he has... Philippians brings about a a new way of living, a new identity because of the resurrection. In verse number 20, ready, he says, but our citizenship is in heaven. So so we, we now don't live for earthly things, we live for eternal things. We don't just live for the here and now, but Jesus has risen and he is back at the right hand of the Father. And I'm living for that. What I do here isn't about here, it's about there. Because Jesus is alive. He really is God. He really is who he says he is. He really gave me what I needed, and that was my, my, my soul to be saved and my eyes to be open to the fact that I am now a citizen of heaven. It says our citizenship is in heaven. And I want you to know today that if you are in Christ, you're a citizen of heaven. I just want you to believe that in your heart today. I just want that to to pump some joy into your soul. If you are in Christ, you're a citizen of heaven. When he's writing this in the book of Philippians, this this language would have really meant something to them because Philippi was a colony of Rome. So they were citizens of Rome, not living in Rome. And so their citizenship of Rome was, was a badge for them. So it was a big deal. They, they longed for their homeland. They longed for Caesar or the emperor to come see them. They longed for the rules and rights and privileges and blessings that they had of Rome as a Roman colony of Philippi. And, and, and so just like they would have loved the fact that their citizenship was in Rome, although they weren't in Rome, Paul's speaking to these kind of people saying, hey, 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 there's a citizenship that's way better because Jesus Jesus is alive. Your citizenship now, it's heaven. It's eternal. He's fixing their eyes on something greater. And I've got three things that I want to give you really quickly, and I want to pray for us today on this Easter Sunday that I want to encourage you. And number one is this. I want you to write this down. If I'm a citizen of heaven, Jesus is my king. If I'm a citizen of heaven, Jesus is my king. He is my leader. He's calling the shots. He is my Lord. He is my king. I I don't need to be the leader of my own life now. I don't need to look to others to lead me. I've got a leader. I've got a Lord. I've got a king. I've got someone calling the shots. My citizenship is in heaven, and Jesus is the king there. He's the king. He's writing to people, again, that were not in Rome, but were always wanting Caesar to come from Rome to visit them because that was their king. That was their Lord. They anticipated him coming, and he's saying, hey, there's a Lord and a king greater than Caesar, and it's Jesus. He is your king, and he is coming back. He is coming back because your citizenship is in heaven. And I love that Jesus is our king because he's a king and a leader that we can trust. Maybe in your life, if you've lived any more than a few minutes, you've had someone over you in authority where you didn't trust their intentions. Anybody ever? (laughs) Everybody? You didn't really know if they were really for you or if they were really for themselves and using you for them being for them. You didn't really know if you could trust their heart. You heard their words, but you didn't trust their heart. Right? What I love about Jesus being our King and Lord is He's a leader you can trust. Yeah. You can trust His heart. You can trust His intentions towards you. How this isn't lip service from Jesus. You can trust a King who laid down His life for you. Oh, how do you know you can trust Him? Well, He died for you. 
He gave himself up for you. He suffered for you. He bled for you. He, he, he left his throne in heaven and clothed himself in humanity and lived among us for you. That's a leader that I say, I want to follow. I joyfully follow Jesus. Following Jesus isn't a burdensome task if if you've been saved by the gospel. It's a joy to follow the leadership and lordship of Jesus. You're a citizen of heaven. Jesus is your king. Anybody grateful he's your king today? Jesus is your king. The second thing is this. If I'm a citizen of heaven, heaven is my home. I know this sounds so simple and it sounds so self-explanatory, but I think it needs to be said. If we are citizens of heaven, heaven is our home. And if heaven is our home, then earth is not. (laughs) If heaven is our home, then where we are right now, Richmond, Virginia, or wherever you're watching this from online or listening to on the podcast, wherever you are, that is not your home. You are a foreigner temporarily living in a land awaiting return home to eternity with Christ. And foreigners in other lands, man, they long to be in their homeland, don't they? It's like, man, you're just waiting to be back home one day, awaiting, knowing, hey, I'm just passing through. This is just temporary. I'm a citizen of heaven, and heaven is my home. Heaven's my home. When you know that you're just passing through somewhere, where you know it's temporary, and you know the end, and you know where you're going, it changes how you live in it, doesn't it? Like, look, if you got to go, if you got to fly to a great place that you're really excited about, let's just think of a great place. What's a great place? What's a great place, Kyle? You got something, bro? (laughs) Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A. I was thinking something more like the Cayman Islands, but okay. (laughs) They're the same. (laughs) No matter where, Chick-fil-A or the Cayman Islands, okay? No matter where you want to go. Like, if I'm on the way to Chick-fil-A and there's construction and there's traffic and there's checkpoints and there's whatever you got to hit, whatever you got to hit, guess what? That's all right. I can endure it. I can detour. Go ahead. Send me around. Go ahead. Get me off that exit ramp. That's okay. I'll loop back around. That's okay. Oh, okay. You, you're going to make me go through Mechanicsville to get to Midlothian? Okay, that's fine. We can do that. We can do that. Why? Because I'm going to Chick-fil-A. I know where I'm going. I'm going to Chick-fil-A. Okay, uh, I know I'm flying out of Richmond to get to Grand Cayman, and anywhere out of Richmond, to get to heaven from Richmond, you got to go through Atlanta. You got to go through Atlanta. And so so we're going to Atlanta, then we're going to Miami, then we're going to Mexico City, and then we're going to, and gosh, them layovers and customs and da, da, da. But that's okay. I can deal with it. Why? Because I'm going to Grand Cayman, baby. If, if I know where I'm going, it, it, it changes the posture of my heart and my spirit while I'm getting there. Some of you, your joy has been sucked out of this life because you're just living for this life. And, and you haven't lived with an eternal perspective that heaven is my home. And I know there's lots of things around me that would be after my joy, but I can still have joy. Why? Because I'm going home. I'm on the way, baby. I'm being detoured and stopped and blocked up and layovers and customs and all this kind of stuff, but I'm on my way. Heaven is my home. Heaven is my home. And you want to have joy in your life? No, man, Jesus is my king. Heaven is my home. I'm on my way. I'm just passing through because Jesus came and he died and he made a way. And the third thing is this. If I'm a citizen of heaven, resurrection is is my hope. Resurrection is my hope. Verse number 20, I want want to close and look at this verse. Verse number 20 says this, as we eagerly await a Savior from there. So he says, hey, we're citizens of heaven, and then he says, here's what I'm doing in the meantime, okay? Here's what I'm doing, ready? I'm eagerly awaiting a Savior from there. Who by the power, look, look, look at this, this is, this is going to encourage some of you today. I don't want us to just fly through this verse. I want God's word to speak to your heart today. Verse number 21, the power that enables him, talking about Jesus, to bring everything under his control. Everything under his control. Here's what he says, hey, Jesus, Jesus has the power to bring everything under his control. 
How do you know? Well, let's look at the cross. <laughs> Jesus had the power to bear the sin of humanity. Like Nate's sin. Past sin, present sin, future sin. Your sin. Past sin, present sin, future sin. Your sin. Like the little one that you don't even think is a big deal because it's just like, oh, it's kind of laughable. It's just a little... And then your sin that is crippling you and leaving wakes of destruction in your life. Like the sin that you see as monster and the sin that you see as many. All of it. Under his control. On the cross, Jesus brought it all under his control. He bore the weight of it. He bore the penalty for it. And and he rose again to defeat it. What was he doing? He was bringing all things under his control. Oh, be of good courage today, my brother and sister, that feels like your life and your sin is out of control because Jesus died and rose again. He can bring it under control. Feel powerless and paralyzed by the, by the magnificence of your own deficiency. That's okay. Jesus can bring it under control. That's what he did on the cross. And if heaven is our home, if we are citizens of heaven, Our hope is resurrection. Like he said, he's going to transform our lowly bodies so that we will be like his glorious body. All of us and all of our sin and all of our fragility and all of our shortcomings and all of our failures, what is our hope? That just like Jesus rose again, we're spiritually alive in Christ. We will rise again. We will be made new. We, we will live in a new heaven and a new earth. We will be given new bodies where sickness won't be a thing and addiction will be no longer and tears will be no more and hurt and pain and pandemic will be no such thing we will be made new why because it's under his control if i'm a citizen of heaven resurrection is my hope living for that day serving king jesus who brings it all under control and i'm headed home i'm passing through i'm on my way and because of that i can have joy talking about real joy not talking about fake the smile on the outside, laugh it off and post a nice picture on it. No, no, no. Joy. Soul transforming, mind renewing, life alternating joy. But a different way. Jesus did it a different way. Jesus didn't come to give you what you wanted. He came to get you what you needed. And the good news is because he gave us what we needed, we are citizens of heaven. Amen. You bow your head and close your eyes with me this morning. I want to say a prayer for us today, but I want to give everyone in the room, I think it's so important on this Easter Sunday, I want to give every person in the room a chance to say yes to Jesus and today become a citizen of heaven. Maybe today you came into this room and maybe a friend invited you, maybe you saw something online, maybe you drove down the road and saw the church and just came in today and you realize today that you're a sinner and you don't need a guy on a stage to tell you that you've messed up and fallen short, but you also realize today that you cannot be the forgiver of your own sins and you cannot be the leader of your own life. And the good news of the gospel today is that Jesus came and he lived the perfect life he couldn't live. He died the death you deserve to die, and on the third day he rose again so that we might know him, that we might be reconciled to God, that we might be forgiven, that we might become citizens of heaven. And maybe you're in the room today and you have not yet made that decision. You have not yet anchored your faith in your life in the finished work of Jesus on the cross, and today you need to do that. Today you need to surrender the lordship of your life over to Jesus. I want to give you an opportunity to do that today. If that's you, every head bowed, every eye closed, I want you to stick your hand up in the air so I can see you. I want to know who I'm praying for today. Today you need Jesus. Today you need to surrender. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? You need to surrender to Jesus today. I want to lead us in a prayer today for those that are making that decision for the first time. I saw at least one hand today. 
But for the sake of the people praying that for the first time, church family, I want to ask us to all say this prayer together. And I say this every week. This prayer is not what saves you. These words are not magical. What saves you is the posture of your heart crying out to God, believing what you're saying today with all of your heart. Church family, can you pray this out loud with me today? Dear God, thank you for sending your son Jesus. Believe that he came and he lived the perfect life. And he died the death I deserve to die. I confess my sin to you. And ask you to forgive me of my sin. And be the Lord and leader of my life. From this day forward. No turning back. In Jesus' name. Amen. And Father, I pray for our church family for the rest of us today, God. Lord, thank you because of what you did for us on the cross that we are citizens of heaven. Thank you that you're our king. Lord, we don't need to look for another one. and We don't need to try to be one ourselves, but thank you that you are our king. Thank you that heaven is our home. And thank you, Lord, that one day you're gonna make all things new. Our hope is in resurrection. Father, fill us with a joy on this Easter weekend today. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters today where their tank is running on empty. Father, I pray today you give them the joy of the Lord. I pray you'd restore to them the joy of their salvation. God, I pray you would fill them with joy today, God. Joy that runs deep. Joy that cannot be uh, taken or stolen. God, joy that comes from heaven today. Lord, do it in their life. Do it in their family. Do it in their homes. Do it in our church. Do it in our city today. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Hey, can you put your hands together for Jesus today?